MatPat has made another How to Train Dragon theory, and considering my whole channel is about this franchise, I guess I still have the authority to see if it's actually true or not. What if I told you that all the magical breath attacks that you see in How to Train Your Dragon are real? Ice true. breath, fire breath, yeah. lightning, acid sound, all of them are just waiting for you to unlock. Okay, so by the sounds of it, he's talking about the fire types. Yeah, he's not wrong there. All the fire types have some basis in science, and I was going to do a bunch of videos on it, literally going through every single fire type and explaining how it's um hell <laughs> and it was going to come after the not class series so stay tuned for that if you're interesting but i guess this might be do a basic breakdown of uh majority of them or maybe just some of the most popular dragons so far he's on the mark not so much on a previous theory which i may or may not cover depends if this does well hello internet welcome to film theory the show that's been drag on you to learn things since 2015. you know when it comes to fantasy creatures Dragon nothing is even universal is starting to get in on the trend announcing that they're gonna go the disney route by giving how to train your dragon yep. a live action remake and that's in addition to the 19 that's seasons of television sad. that they've already made out of this thing so with seasons. all this dragon talk going on i decided I to re so the much. entire how to train your dragon series and and of course, my theorist brain started to do the thing that all theorist brains do. It started mm -hmm. overanalyzing everything about the film. Specifically, I was fascinated by all the different breath no, attacks that the dragons in the world seem to have. Sure, yeah. you've got yourself your classic fire breath, but over the course of the series, we also learn about dragons who use boiling water, electricity, mm -hmm. ice, acid, even sound. The creatures yeah. that use all these attacks are also really diverse in terms of their size and appearance, which got me wondering, is any of this actually possible? What would animals who use these sorts of attacks yes. actually look like? Well, How to train your <laughs> puts a surprising amount of care into their dragon designs, but do There's they some actually hold science. up to real-world scrutiny? Well, saddle up, loyal theorists. Today, we're looking at the biology of these dragons to see which of the breath attacks are the most biologically sound. Let me okay, tell so you, if dragons like the ones that you see here existed ones. in the real world, the most effective power isn't the one that you'd expect. So I think we should just go ahead and get the granddaddy of all dragon breath attacks out of the way first here, the iconic fire breath. Now, obviously, no lizard or reptile in nature actually straight up breathes fire like a dragon. That's an entire fictional thing for myth. But believe it or not, this sort mm -hmm. of thing is very feasible in nature. And we can say this thanks to an itty bitty little insect called the bombardier beetle. Now, I've already talked yeah. about this in detail in an episode about the terrifying truth of fire Pokemon over on our system. Real animal that right. So just to like quickly acid. sum this one up, when threatened, the bombardier beetle shoots out scalding chemicals at its foes. Mm -hmm. It does this by using three organs in its abdomen. Two of those organs are glands that produce hydroquinones and hydrogen peroxide. The third organ is where those two chemicals mix together. When combined, they perform nice. a reduction oxidation reaction which basically means that they get themselves really, really hot. The bombardier beetle then shoots that liquid at whatever threat they perceive. Now, what the bombardier beetle shoots is a heated liquid, which lines up well with the Skaldron. Has some basis in the real world, a lot of the dragon pack moves, but Skaldron doesn't produce their firepower like that. All the dragons have like an internal like heat source. There's some sort of organ, I'm, I'm guessing, that produces the fire that or the lava, you know, or the gas necessary to be created. So I'm imagining the sculpture just sucks the seawater and then just boils it and then just spits it back out. Simple solution rather than mixing chemicals work with a variety of different chemical combinations for instance potassium chlorate and ordinary table sugar when combined with a drop of sulfuric acid releases large quantities of heat energy in the form of awesome purple flames like legitimately a purple flame spewing dragon would be awesome on the less awesome but still very biologically feasible <laughs> side are farts you see in a short we released earlier this week we took a closer look at the new dungeons and dragons movie to see just how its dragon uses fire breath based on the footage that we see in the film you can can see that it breathes out a clear gas that it then ignites using a spark in the back of its throat or just general heat in the world around it. That gas that it's spewing, that's likely methane, a gas that occurs yep. naturally in almost all animals. If you look closely at Toothers as when he opens mouth to fire, there's a green gas that comes out instead of just a fireball. All these dragons spew or secrete a gas of some sort and it changes. It's not always methane, although it might be a common one. A lot of dragons have different sort of gases that they could produce and then they ignite it. Not too sure how they ignite it. What about some of the more unusual types of breath attacks that mm -hmm. we see in these movies? Like, say, electric breath. It's something that we see in fantasy media all the time. The legend electric of Vox breath. Machina begins with <laughs> both of these examples result in one major problem. Electricity is unpredictable. Electric charges are created when electrons jump between objects. Since electrons are negatively charged particles, having fewer electrons creates a positive electric charge, and having a bunch of extra electrons creates a negative charge. And when the difference between the positive and the 
negative get big enough that electrons jump to balance themselves out to become neutral again. The problem is, it'll do this with literally anything it can find. The electricity doesn't care. It'll just go to the closest thing that it can trade electrons with. But for an electric breath attack to work, dragons wouldn't just need to change its okay, electron okay. count. It would also need a way to make sure that its target was the best option to transfer electrons with. And the only way to do that would be by manipulating the amount of electrons the target has. That said, directing lightning can be done. I was going to say, he's referring to a screw because I think the screw is like one of the few that actually has lightning abilities, as well as the plus. But they don't actually create it or generate it, they redirect it. Screws tend to hang out with storms, they can store it for a bit, I think, as well. But this is actually a good point. How does it target a target? <laughs> How does it target a being? Because as he says, that's not really how electricity works. So I'm going to see, I'm going to see, this is actually quite an interesting point. Back in January of 2012, reports started to circulate about the U.S. Army testing a lightning weapon. One that was able to attack using 50 billion watts of energy. How they managed to control the lightning? Using a laser. It was called the Laser Induced Plasma Channel, or LIPC for short. Basically, plasma. how it worked was that a laser plasma blast. put out a pulse of energy. This pulse had to be incredibly brief, only about two trillionths of a second. But that was enough to create a path for the lightning to follow. Before that, in 1993, the U.S. Air Force and Naval Weapons Research Divisions both successfully conducted tests into plasma railguns. So he's saying Devices that squirrels have lasers? And then launch it in specific directions. <laughs> Basically, they were trying to weaponize balls of lightning that were hotter than the surface of the sun and could detonate with an explosive force of five pounds of TNT on contact, all while discharging oh an electromagnetic burst that could scramble most electronic devices in the area. And while that was certainly impressive, what was even more impressive was this thing's name, Project Marauder, with Marauder actually being a real acronym that stood for real words that made sense. Get this. Magnetically accelerated Water. ring to achieve ultra high directed energy Church. and radiation. Ultra. Slow clap. I hope that someone got a raise for coming up with that one. And that while both good. projects did wind up being <laughs> successful, the only problem were the power demands. They were too high for weapons that had such limited range, which made them impractical, and the projects went away. In short, the best way of making a lightning Rip. weapon work for both the military and, by extension, our dragon friends is to get really. Really Why did he bring up the, the red death? target, which then encourages Skrill. the lightning to jump over to them. And there are creatures that do this exact thing. The most famous of these is obviously the electric eel, which is able mm. to release powerful electric shocks upwards of 650 volts, five times more powerful than a standard US wall socket. It then uses those shocks to stun their prey so they can eat them. Believe it or not, this actually lines up really well with what we see in How to Train Your Dragon. Rather than launching targeted lightning beams from his mouth, Toothless is instead able to create smaller electric sparks around around its body. In the hidden world, Toothless seems to create electric potentials all across his own body. Okay, so I guess that's how Toothless makes his fire blast. Like, he produces a gas, and then he has electric potential inside of his body, which ignites it, which makes sense. In short, How to Train Your Dragon gives us the most realistic portrayal of what a dragon's lightning powers would have to look like in real life. Just Moving no on to the coolest to of the attacks that I see in these movies, Ice Breath. See what I did there? I said cool and you thought that I meant cool as in awesome, but I meant literally cool, like from a temperature basis. Thermodynamically cool. Just well, why this is your day job. <laughs> How to Train Your Dragon 2, we meet the Bewilder Beasts. Giant dragons that breathe out super cool. Yeah, I was gonna say, like, there isn't much mm, ice... Breath dragons? There's like two I could think of, which one of them was the board of Liquid that's able to freeze on contact. Now, know what you're saying. A reptile that breathes ice. Sounds impossible. And you're not wrong. As cold-blooded animals, reptiles and ice just don't mix all that well. Well, that's a debatable fact. <laughs> because dragons, although they're reptiles, kind of, they're under reptilia. It might be under a different classification, to be honest. In this show, they have been seen to be warm-blooded. Upon a quick Google, turns out dinosaurs are under the class of reptilia, and they are warm-blooded as well. Not to mention other extinct marine reptiles and flying reptiles. So they are not cold-blooded. But if we stop and take a look at how the bewilder beasts act in the movie, we can actually find a scientifically feasible explanation for this breath weapon. In fact, it would actually function very similarly to fire breath, except in reverse. You see, explosions and fire? Well, those are exothermic reactions. They're chemical reactions that release... <laughs> No thermic reaction to create time. ice breath that freezes on contact, our dragons would need to create the exact opposite reaction than that. An endothermic reaction, where the reactants absorb heat energy from their surroundings, thereby making things colder. And we actually have the perfect example of this in our day-to-day -day lives using instant ice packs. If you've ever gotten into an injury, these things are clutch. And the beauty of them is that they're just super simple. The liquid <laughs> inside the cold when pack I go to is the just school water, dance. easy. But inside the water is another tube that contains ammonium nitrate, a common ingredient of 
fertilizer. When you bend the ice pack and cause the inner tube to break, that ammonium nitrate salt dissolves into the water around it to create an endothermic chemical reaction that absorbs heat. This reaction then causes the water to cool down and the pack becomes ice. Now just look at the bewilder beast as he breathes. He's breathing out a liquid that freezes into ice on contact. What I kind of find funny about all this is that all these fantastical elements seem like oh, it's completely impossible. But to be honest, reality tends to be stranger than fiction. All this sort of stuff is possible with obviously chemistry. <laughs> nitrate in another. That would then allow the dragon to keep a stable internal body temperature despite being a cold-blooded creature. The chemical reaction that creates the ice isn't happening until after- I don't- maybe the Builder Beast is a cold-blooded creature, but most other dragons are not. It breathes out those two reactants. It's a cool attack that would be powered by even cooler science. And heck, if the animal needed more protection, maybe it's insulated with layers of blubber, like some ancient reptilian dinosaurs had. That would explain mm -hmm. why the bewilder beasts are just so naturally big. But now let's switch gears awesome. into something completely yeah. <laughs> different. Something that really starts to get us out of the realm of fantasy. In the original How to Train Your Dragon, the Thunder Drum Dragon uses a sound-based breath weapon. When startled, mm -hmm. the Thunder Drum produces a concussive sound that can kill a man at close range. Out of all the elements that are quite fantastical, this one seems the most feasible because there is animals in real life that could just are very loud. It's just on an exaggerated level. <laughs> we already have animals in the real world that use sound like a gun. Case in point, the pistol shrimp. This little guy is no joke, and its power even comes from this shrimp. massive claw. When it wants to intimidate an opponent, attack prey, or even burrow into a rock, it's able to snap the claw shut quickly enough to shoot an air bubble at whatever it's aiming at. At long ranges, that makes a lot an IRL Air Force. <laughs> Deck you have something to look out for. Loud scary sound, but at short range, it can stun or flat out kill any other small shrimp or fish. Again, exactly like what we hear about with the thunder drum. Produces a concussive sound that can kill a man at close range. And when you look at the science here, it's easy to see how they're so lethal. The snap of the claw produces a sound that can reach 218 decibels in volume underwater. Just how loud's that? Well, a whisper? It's roughly 30 decibels. A normal conversation is about 60 decibels, and a rock concert hits at around 120 decibels. But decibels rise it's exponentially. That means concert. that a 10 decibel increase makes the sound 10 times louder. The 218 oh. decibel <laughs> pistol like. shrimp is roughly 10 billion times louder than the 120 decibel concert. Yep, you heard that right, billion, with a B. Now, the numbers there aren't going to exactly line up one-to-one -one with what you'd probably expect because sound works differently underwater, it's muffled yep. by the different pressures, but the sound is powerful enough that American sound submarines used to use reefs full of pistol shrimp to hide from Japanese sonar. And as you can see here in this video, the pops made by the <laughs> pistol shrimp are incredibly loud compared to their size, audible even through aquarium glass. If a dragon were able to reproduce this sort of attack above the water, maybe by snapping its jaw shut quickly, it would be devastating. And as an added no, bonus, we see in How to Train Your Dragon that the dragons rely on sound as one of their primary senses while hunting. Noise! Make lots of it to throw off a dragon's aim! So not only would the sound potentially be deadly, but it's also going to be devastating for any opponent's navigational abilities. Which brings us now to one of the mm -hmm. easiest attacks to explain using science, Acid Breath. In How to Train Your Dragon 3, the villainous acid. Grimmel has several tamed Death Gripper dragons that spew acid that's able to corrode through almost anything it touches. Now, while the strength of the Death Gripper acid is definitely cranked up to 11 for the movies, this sort of offensive ability is pretty darn common across the animal kingdom. Several insects, like termites, ants, and scorpions, are able to spray or sting with acid, while many species yeah. of cobra are just able to accurately spew their acidic venom several feet away. Even some Again. birds, like the full marble <laughs> trell, a turkey vulture can animals. vomit up stomach acid and use it as a projectile weapon. That is pretty darn gross. It is also pretty darn similar to what we see the Death Grippers do in the movies, so don't really need to explain it much further than that. So as it turns out, these sorts of breath weapons are shockingly plausible in real life. There are real world mm -hmm. animals out there right now using these very attacks, like the pistol shrimp and the spitting cobra. And if they're not using the exact attack, then they're using mechanisms that are pretty darn close to what we see happening happening in fantasy media, like with the bombardier beetle and the electric eel. But you know what they say, truth can be stranger than fiction. I'm surprised you didn't go into like how gronkles work. I mean, to be honest, the gronkles are not that complicated either. They eat rocks and the lava inside their belly or another stomach. I imagine they have two, I think that there's reference that they have two stomachs, one for food and one for actual rocks. Melts it down and Sure, the pistol shrimp might not be sitting atop his hoard of gold, and he might not be able to ride a Komodo dragon as majestically through the air as Hiccup on top of Toothless, but the animal world is crazy, and we're understanding more about the wonders of how it works every single day. In this world full of technology and screens and CGI, we often overlook that our world is already a really cool place filled with incredible creatures. Sometimes it takes a fictional series to help us appreciate the real-life wonders around us. Fully agree, and that's kind of what my goal is. 
Because I'm interested in science. I love all that stuff. I love the real world. And obviously I like House of Dragon Dragon. So I'm sort of explaining stuff like that through the medium of House of Dragon Dragon. Even though I'm not that smart. <laughs> um, his last one about House of Dragon Dragon I think is quite wrong. <laughs> um, maybe I'll do another video on that. But this one, pretty based. <laughs> based. Don't train your dragon. Well, I disagree. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. GTFN. Ta-ta for now.